Hello, I'm Leonia Ramont and I'd like to talk to you about collaborative design for Quest-based learning. You'll be able to find all the resources that I mention at designfordelightfullearning.blogspot.com Hey there! If you have ever watched a group of young people play a massively multi-user game such as World of Warcraft, you'll have been struck by the extraordinary complexity of the skills they have mastered apparently effortlessly as they pursued their learning via a myriad of quests. These quests provide small achievable tasks that allow them to develop a range of skills step by step, accumulatively. And as they become absorbed in the story, completing these tasks to gain desirable rewards, they develop a wide range of skills. They are learning how to collaborate, be patient, guide and mentor, Greetings. solve problems, work as a team, lead and follow, plan, and all the while participating in numbers of conversations at the same time, all seemingly without trying. Never before have young people been able to access such extraordinarily beautiful, complex and compelling collaborative experiences. The success of these games has allowed game developers oh, like well. Blizzard to invest huge amounts of money into refining these games. Each iteration of the program benefiting from the feedback of participants, allowing the designers to constantly hone their game design. As educators, we can't fail to recognize the incredible effectiveness of the scaffolding for learning these games provide. Of course, games like World of Warcraft are very difficult to adapt to our curriculum requirements. However, they do provide an excellent opportunity to explore how self-directed learning can be scaffolded through quests. So much so that IBM has written a report called Virtual Worlds Real Leaders. They argue that the skills that players develop in this game are relevant to the real world and they employ staff who have a guild leader background. In this session I'm going to give an introduction to multi-user virtual world games and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we might use quests for learning, about whole brain learning and constructivism. I'll also talk a bit about quests, what they are, when to use them and why, and give some examples. I'll also explore where to start with Quest Atlantis and web quests, and then talk a little bit about some useful concepts for going further. Xernia, a 19-year-old guild leader, argues that World of Warcraft could equally be called World of Peacecraft. This is because there are often so many good-hearted people who assist each other. In World of Warcraft, it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter what your status is, and it doesn't matter what you own. What matters is what you do, how you behave, and how skillful you are. A child watching their parent playing in World of Warcraft grows up with a different expectation of learning than we did. Books and texts play a role, but the wor their world is a 3D world. They want to participate. They want to matter. And this is something that we can learn from these environments and bring into our classrooms. Certainly there are many proponents for whole brain learning. And one of them is a woman called Renee Fuller, who was dyslexic and taught herself to read. By using stories and a simple decoding system, the system that she developed is now used for teaching learning disabled students to read. Jill Bolte Taylor is a neuroanatomist who suffered a stroke. While her left brain wasn't functioning, her right brain was actually fully alive and 
helped her feel connected to the universe. She argues strongly that we need both sides of the brain. And certainly, in the world that we currently live in, being aware of our connection is really important. The new scientist said in 2008, It's 2020 and we're a decade into a huge experiment in which we're trying to convert our country to a sustainable or steady state economy. The future that we can create together is going to be far more sustainable than the one that we create if we just use our left brain. Another proponent for whole brain learning is David Jonathan. Constructivism is an approach to learning that's very much about active participation where students construct, they, put, they can construct projects, they also construct meaning, and they construct knowledge. They work together collaboratively, and they use dialogue, conversation. They reflect on what they're doing, and the whole thing is contextualized within meaningful problems, interesting cases, real-world issues. And this, by their nature, is complex. That is what the world is. And the learning is intentional. They are committed to learning. And it's active. Now this web that's in front of you is, has no particular sequence. Every element is interrelated and of equal importance. Now quests are, have a number of factors. So let's start with a definition. What is a quest? Well, the dictionary says it is an act or an instance of seeking or pursuing something, a search with a purpose. In short, it's a task. Now, it's useful when students are learning larger topics, systemic topics, nutrition, geology, geography, various elements of science, topics where they can actively pursue a task. So why use it? Well, there's numbers of reasons for using quests, and I'll talk more about flow later. But for now, it is the active participation and the empowerment that students experience that really helps to bring the learning alive, that engages their whole brain. Joseph Campbell talks about every student is a hero. He wrote a book about the hero journey and he describes the call to adventure and the challenges and the obstacles that the learner meets, how they move from innocence to wisdom. So where is a good place to start when we want to experiment with quests in our classrooms? Well, a good place to start is a path that's well trodden, and that is web quests. Web quests were developed in America and have now been widely adopted. There are huge database resources with lots and lots of quests for all different levels of classes. But the basic structure is that they have an introduction, they have a, a lively task, something that's engaging. They describe a process where students take different roles and assist each other to complete the task. There is an evaluation process and there's a conclusion and lots of resources to help them get started. Quest Atlantis is a, another very useful place to start. It has been designed for students between the ages of 9 and 14. There are many, many quests in a virtual world. And the quests are completed in the real world, in the classroom, in the community, either alone or with other students in their class, or with students from other classrooms around the world. 
Another very attractive element of Quest Atlantis is that it has a very strong social message and the quests are categorised under various headings including creative expression, diversity affirmation, personal agency, social responsibility, environmental awareness, healthy communities, compassionate wisdom. Here is an example of a quest in Quest Atlantis. In the Dracos unit, players are tasked with breeding a species of dragonfly that is unique to Atlantis. To do this, they must understand genetics and how traits are passed from parent to offspring. Players also confront their own sense of morality as they determine whether gene splicing to produce a particular type of Dracos is ethical. Just freshly released is a simulator game called Fate of the World. It is, has been developed jointly by Oxygen University and game developers and they use real statistics that students can adjust to see what the consequences are of taking various actions on climate change. This potentially is a very powerful tool for quest-based learning. So, having found some basic tools, you might want to explore the idea of developing quests further. So here are some useful concepts to help you on your way. Firstly, there's flow. What is flow? Flow is a concept researched by Mihalia Csikszentmihalyi, who in 1976 was very curious to understand why artists were able to lose themselves completely in their work. And he discovered that people experience this all around the world. They call it flow. There are a number of elements that describe flow. These are a challenging activity that requires skill, the merging of action and awareness, clear goals and feedback, concentration on the task at hand, the paradox of control, the loss of self-consciousness and the transformation of time. Now flow works in that you start with a challenge and a skill. And you can, as you move your skill up, if the challenge is just above your skill level, you actually experience flow. If the challenge is too high, you become anxious. If the challenge is too low, you become bored. So games are really adept at keeping this balance between challenge and skill. There are a number of activities that are flow activities. You'll recognize them. There's friendship and relaxation, risk and chance, problem solving, competition, designing or discovering something new. There's also a number of strategies for building flow. They start with setting an overall goal and as many sub-goals as are realistically feasible. To find ways of measuring progress in terms of the goals chosen. To keep concentrating on what one is doing and to keep making finer and finer distinctions in the challenges involved in the activity. To develop the skills necessary to interact with the opportunities available. And to keep raising the stakes if the activity becomes boring. John Seeley Brown was the director of Xerox Park. He talks about the importance of learning by being. He argues that we need to shift our thinking away from content-specific learning objectives towards thinking about games as systems that afford new types of agency and new ways of looking at the world, where people learn how to organise socially and solve problems quickly. You can see how this is increasingly important in our world, which changes very rapidly. Dorothy Hethgen developed the mantle of the expert. 
she's had a, a major influence in British drama in education. And she had an insight. She said, and then it began to dawn on me. People had to have a point of view. The point of view of innkeeping, the point of view of soldiers who are working for Rome, the point of view of angels, the point of view of kings. And that's when it started coming together. You'll see in the following bit of video some students who were actually um, socially um, disadvantaged. And you see how they come alive when they take roles in a story because suddenly they have a passion, they have a purpose, they have a quest, a mission. You don't want to hear, but you've got to hear. And you'll settle with what yeah, you've got and be grateful. Mother, does this mean you're going to let this happen? You're going to knock our houses down. I've lived in this city from the beginning. I've seen every house built. It takes months, sometimes a year, to build a house. Now, learning by designing is something that Jonason has described. He argues that designing assists students to build a knowledge base as they are required to analyze the subject domain and to develop mental models to represent it. They then have to frame their understanding within those models. This process readily leads to generative learning, learning that extends these mental models. He argues that the people who learn the most are the designers and that Designing for their peers to learn or for younger students to learn is a very powerful way of engaging students in learning. So again, here is something that can help you design good quests. Simply enroll your students to design the quests. This is a philosophy that Stephen Heppel applied with very good effect at Ultralamp. He asked students to help him design a piece of software, to help other students learn their times table. And I'll let him speak for himself. Times helps children learn their multiplication tables fast. It doesn't do anything else. It's fun, it's text-free, and it works in any language that shares our number system. How do we design it? We talk to children, we talk to parents, and we talk to teachers, and we took their advice. It works, it works well, and it's interesting. Try it. Read the papers that are with it. So thank you for your time. I have a strong plea that we en enrol our students, we empower our students to join us in making learning delightful. Thank you very much.